Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Robert Hoagland? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the disappearance, then offer my analysis. Robert Hoagland was born in 1963 and lived in Newtown, Connecticut. In his early 20s, he met a woman named Lori at a culinary school. The couple married and would go on to have three sons. In 1994, the family moved to California. The move appeared to be somewhat impulsive. Neither Robert nor Lori had a job waiting in California. Robert had a tough time finding employment, but eventually found work as a chef at a country club. He was fired, but did not tell his wife. Instead, he disappeared for three weeks. He was easily found due to his credit card use. Robert explained his disappearance to his wife by saying that he was scared, and he was ashamed that he couldn't earn money. At some point, Robert and Lori returned to Newtown, Connecticut, and Robert continued working in the culinary field. But he was not happy with how many hours he had to work in that industry. He wanted to spend more time with his family. In 2001, Robert studied to become a real estate appraiser. He appeared to enjoy his new career. In 2012, Robert started working part-time as a law clerk at a firm in Bridgeport, Connecticut, owned by one of his friends. So he was a real estate appraiser and had this part-time job. By this time, Robert's son, Max, had run into some problems with substance use. In early 2013, Max was treated in a rehabilitation facility. Lori went with a friend on a vacation to Turkey in July of 2013. When she was away, she communicated with Robert via email. Before she returned, two of the family's laptop computers were stolen. Robert had hidden the computers in Lori's Volkswagen. Max had taken the Volkswagen to an abandoned building in Bridgeport. Max said that he found the computers in the car and hid them in the building so they wouldn't get stolen while he was there. When he returned to the place where he had hidden them, they were gone. Max believed that two men who he knew had stolen the computers. Robert suspected that Max had stolen the computers in order to get drugs. Robert sent Lori an email saying he was sorry for permitting the missing computer situation to occur. He had a feeling of shame. Robert and Max returned to the abandoned building in Bridgeport and confronted the two men about the stolen computers. The men denied involvement. Before moving to the timeline of the disappearance, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Upside. Inflation has everybody thinking about ways to cut back on spending, like dining out less and buying fewer items at the grocery store. Most people agree that there is nothing fun about less. Now, thanks to Upside, you don't have to cut back. I like Upside because it helps to compensate for inflation by giving me cash back on necessities like groceries, fuel, and dining out. It's easy to use and convenient. To get started with Upside, download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play. Use my promotion code, Dr. Grande, to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business. Pay as usual with a credit card or debit card and get paid. You can earn three times more cash back with Upside as compared to loyalty programs or credit card rewards. You can cash out at any time to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week. That's probably one reason Upside has a 4.8 star rating on the App Store. Now moving to the timeline of the disappearance. On July 25, 2013, which was four days before Lori was going to return from Turkey, Robert withdrew $600 from one of the family's bank accounts. During the evening on July 27, Robert and Lori talked on the phone. They confirmed the plan for Robert to pick up Lori from the JFK airport in New York City on July 29. Early in the morning on July 28, Robert drove his wife's Volkswagen Golf to a local bakery where he purchased bagels. He then drove her vehicle to a mobile gas station on Churchill Road and purchased fuel. 
At 6.45 a.m., while he was there, surveillance video captured him buying a map of the eastern United States. Robert departed the gas station and returned to his residence. He had breakfast with his son, Max. According to Max, Robert paid some bills and played Scrabble online. Sometime at around 10 or 11 a.m., Robert walked outside to mow the lawn. As Robert was mowing the lawn, Max approached him and said he was leaving and would return in a few hours. Max requested the keys for the Volkswagen, which Robert gave to him. Max drove away in that vehicle. A neighbor would later tell the authorities that he witnessed Robert and Max talking on the lawn, which corroborates the story that Max supplied. The next day, July 29, Lori arrived at JFK Airport at about 4 p.m. She attempted to reach Robert on his cell phone and on the home phone, but he did not answer either one. She assumed that Robert had let his phone battery die, and he was on his way to pick her up. He often let his battery charge run all the way down. After waiting for two hours with no sign of Robert, Lori took a taxi to the home of her stepsister instead of returning to her house. Lori found out that Robert did not show up to work that morning and did not answer phone calls from his boss. At 7.30 p.m., Lori called the police and reported Robert missing. Not long after this, the police in Bridgeport contacted Lori and told her that Max had been arrested the night before and charged with third-degree criminal trespass. Max was arrested near the same abandoned industrial building where Robert had met the two men who Max accused of taking the laptop computers. Max told the police that he was there to purchase drugs, but had his mother's permission to take her vehicle. Lori told the police that Max did not have her permission. Max would eventually plead guilty to the criminal trespass charge. Lori arrived home on July 30. She discovered that Robert was still not there. There were a few curious items that Lori and the police discovered at the house. Robert's Mini Cooper was parked in the driveway. His passport, blood pressure medication, and his cell phone were in the house. His dirty clothes were in the laundry. The lawnmower had not been returned to where it was typically stored, and Robert's sneakers were next to it. Two pairs of Robert's loafers were in the house, including one pair that he wore to the gas station. Lori was able to make entry into Robert's safe, where she found thousands of dollars that he normally kept there. None of this money was missing. About a week later, Lori found additional items belonging to Robert under a doll in a chair in their bedroom, specifically his car keys and his wallet. The police talked to the two men who were accused of taking the laptop computers, but they couldn't find any connection to Robert's disappearance. On Robert's work computer, the police found a number of searches for an address in Rhode Island, but this clue did not lead anywhere. When they searched Robert's computer at his house, they found that he had downloaded a program designed to delete his search history. He did this within a month of his disappearance. The police had no idea where Robert was. They didn't know what happened to him. A number of people reported seeing Robert in various places like Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, and Los Angeles, but no sighting was confirmed. What nobody knew at the time was that sometime around November of 2013, Robert moved to Rock Hill, New York. This is in upstate New York, about an hour and a half west of Newtown, Connecticut. Robert was using the alias Richard King. On December 5, 2022, the police responded to Robert's apartment after his roommate found his body. Robert died at the age of 59. The police initially did not know who he was, but then they discovered paperwork, which led to his identification as Robert Hoagland. Now moving to my analysis. Before Robert's body was found, the police had two theories about what happened to him. Robert left voluntarily, or he was the victim of a crime. With the first theory, he may have run off to start a new life, or brought an end to his life. If the second theory was true, the presumption was that Robert was dead, like he was killed by criminals. The first theory would ultimately be proven correct. Robert did leave to start a new life. This leads to the question, was voluntary disappearance the logical theory with the evidence available at the time Robert disappeared? Like, should the police have figured this out before Robert's body 
was found in Rock Hill, New York. Let's take a look at the various factors that support and refute the voluntary disappearance theory, starting with the factors that support it. Robert's relationship with his wife was not always good. At one point, they were separated for two years. Robert had left his family suddenly 19 years before he permanently disappeared when they had moved to California. In the time leading up to his disappearance in 2013, Robert was under stress due to his son's drug use and the fact that his son had recently moved back into the family home. About a week before Robert disappeared, he told a friend of his that he was unhappy with his job and was thinking about quitting. Within a month of his disappearance, Robert downloaded software to delete his search history. Robert withdrew $600 a few days before disappearing, and on the day that he disappeared, he purchased a map of the eastern United States. There wasn't much evidence supporting the idea that Robert was a victim of a crime. There was no blood, no signs of a struggle, his body was not found, no witnesses or video indicated a crime, and nothing was stolen. Now moving to the factors that refute the voluntary disappearance theory. Robert was committed to his three sons and interacted with them frequently. He even changed careers to have more time with them. Robert left items behind that would have been useful when starting a new life, like thousands of dollars in cash, his passport, cell phone, his medication, and his favorite shoes. It's difficult to start a new life without comfortable shoes, as it often involves a great deal of walking. The fact that Robert mowed his lawn right before he disappeared is inconsistent with him preparing to leave. Grass cutting rarely makes it onto people's starting a new life checklist. People who knew Robert said that purchasing a paper map for him was not unusual. He was a voracious consumer of paper maps. He had them everywhere in his vehicle. When considering the evidence, should the police have figured out that Robert left to start a new life? I don't think so. I think that it was reasonable to believe that he voluntarily disappeared, but that doesn't mean that he started a new life. I think it was more reasonable to believe that he left and brought an end to his life. It's very hard to live under the radar in modern society, and Robert didn't take items that would have been useful to him, like his medication and his wallet. Even if the police had known that Robert started a new life, they didn't have any way to find him. I think that the police acted appropriately with the information they had available. Moving to the next question, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Robert was highly committed to his family. He wanted a productive work life, which could support a healthy family life. Robert was not a big fan of working long hours, but at the same time, he felt pressure to be a good provider for his family. He was kind of trapped in a no-win situation. If he worked long hours, he felt badly about himself because he was exhausted, unhappy, and not spending enough time with his family. However, he also felt good about working long hours because he was providing for his family and keeping shame at a distance. Robert disappeared for three weeks in 1994 when he was under a similar type of pressure. I think that Robert had difficulty coping with certain types of stress. Sometimes people reach a point where they simply turn off under pressure. They don't have any adaptive strategies left. Therefore, they take drastic action. In Robert's case, when he was overwhelmed, he would just disappear. I think that's what happened in July of 2013. Robert was once again reaching the limit of what he could handle. He was feeling a lot of shame over how he was dealing with the behavior of his son. He took responsibility for his son's behavior, even though Robert wasn't responsible. Robert was experiencing inappropriate guilt and shame. These are symptoms of depression. Robert did not want to face his wife, even though she didn't blame him for what happened. As he thought about his wife returning from her international trip, the stress was just too much. Robert decided that it would be easier to run away and start a new life. Despite his withdrawal of $600 from the bank a few days before he disappeared, I think his decision to disappear was impulsive. He may have taken the money out in order to keep his options open, but I don't think he was dead set on disappearing at that time. He was probably ambivalent. He had strong feelings in both directions. As he was pushing his lawnmower over the grass right before he left, Robert realized that the grass would always grow back. It was a metaphor for his problems. 
He viewed these problems as inescapable. Robert was simply tired of pushing a mower of despair over a lawn of never-ending tension. When Robert ultimately left, he did not intend to hurt his family. His intent was simply to leave behind the stress. But that meant leaving everything behind. I don't think that the message in his departure was, my family is terrible. Rather, it was, I am terrible. This was a disappearance based on self-loathing and a sense of failure. It was not based on blaming others for anything they did or did not do. Once Robert did leave, the longer he remained separated from his family, the greater the shame of returning would have been. Therefore, as time progressed, it added links to the chain that was holding him from reunification with his family. The weight of the chain eventually became so heavy that escape was impossible. Those are my thoughts on the case of Robert Hoagland. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.